know what really makes us mad is wasting money on CDs with only one or two good songs. Yeah. Tell them about punk. What's up, posers? Welcome to Punk Lotto Pod. I'm your co-host, Justin Hensley. I'm your other co-host, Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where we assign our guests a year, and they choose one punk, hardcore, emo, or punk-adjacent album from that year for us to discuss. Today's episode is actually a Patreon-sponsored episode. So our album today has been selected by our patron, Timothy. He did this by joining our $10 tier, which there are two of those available a month. Where basically our, they get to choose whatever they want for us to talk about. Luckily, no one has decided to punish us yet. Yeah, I'm surprised by that. <laughs> um, I guess people want to hear us talk about things that they like. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it is. They don't want to hear us talk about something that's awful. <laughs> I'm sure somebody will. Yeah, eventually. It'll happen. We get veto power, though, if it's too bad. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are obvious, obvious automatic vetoes, like... If you listen to the show, I'm sure you know. (laughs) But yeah, it's basically free reign. Like, we don't even assign them a year. We just, you know, they just give us something to talk about. And uh, it's a fun one. Today we're doing a record from the year 2006, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Though, if you want to become a patron and get that $10 You Pick the Record tier, you can join us on patreon.com slash punklottopod. If you don't want to shell out the 10 bucks, you can uh, throw down a dollar and get access to all of our weekly bonus audio. We, this week we are going to do... Uh, <laughs> this week we're going to talk about the first episode of Muppets Tonight. <laughs> yeah. For no other reason than we can, I guess. Um, fun out of a conversation at the beginning of a Patreon where we talked about it and then we suggested it as patreon content and at least one of our patrons said they would be into it so (laughs) we're gonna do it so it only takes one (laughs) yeah that's the kind of power you can wield with just a dollar (laughs) you can suggest patreon content for us to do and we will probably do it for ten dollars you can make all of our listeners listen to whatever you want us to talk about (laughs) yeah so uh yeah head over to patreon.com punk lotto pod uh we have all the social medias instagram twitter and facebook at punk lotto pod punk lotto pod at gmail.com is the email and punk lotto pod dot substack dot com voicemail is 202 688 punk we have a lot of things you can get us at so feel free all right so again this episode was brought to us by timothy so very exciting album that we're going to be talking about today kind of a big name Um, But before we get to that, the album he selected came out in the year 2006, so I thought we would take a little time and check out some of the other albums that came out that year. Uh, Let us see. This is the year of the Black Parade. Probably the biggest, most important record of this genre on that year. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, there are some significant records. I wouldn't have called it that... I mean, it was definitely a big record, but I wouldn't have called it so important that year that it came out but it definitely would become more important as that as this band would maintain popularity really kind of only getting bigger but arctic monkeys put out whatever people say i am that's what i'm not not a band that i would have expected to have the longevity that they have had do they Uh, no way talks about arctic monkeys yeah literally someone just mentioned the arctic monkeys to me like two days ago (laughs) really yeah people listen to that band (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, I know people that were, like, super into whatever that last record that huh. came out. Yeah, they're big. Didn't know. The more you know. I, I had no idea. I, I mean, is it a British thing? No. I mean, it's, it's Americans that I know. Yeah, I mean, they put out a record in 2018. Never underestimate the power of a main, semi-mainstream successful artist, I guess. I mean, I guess they kind of went away and came back. Maybe that's... Because the one before it was in 2013, but... I couldn't even tell you what an Arctic Monkey sounded like. I remember what they sounded like then. <laughs> yeah, maybe they I don't mean, sound they de- like that anymore. They definitely got more like the generic pop version of that 
to my Ooh, ears, but he's coming for the monkeys. Yeah, not my monkeys. <laughs> uh, in that same vein, we have uh, Sam's Town by the Killers. What's on that one? Is that Soul but not a Soldier? No, Sam's Town is When You Were Young. That's the big song. Oh, okay. Actually, kind of the only one, the only big song from that record, I think, for reasons unknown, I think it is maybe another single, but Sam's Town is a Sam sounds a good record. Uh, I can I can dig it. I've heard it enough times. I appreciate the way that uh, Brandon Flowers uh, rejected all of the auto tuning that they did on his voice on the first record. So he was like, "No, leave my pitchy, <laughs> wobbly stuff in there. It's an affect. You wouldn't <laughs> auto tune the Cure. <laughs> no, you would not." They'd lose it. Do you, do you want to hear a robot saying, show me, show me, show me <laughs> how you do that trick? Show me, show me, show. Now I want Fred Schneider to do it, though. <laughs> the one that makes me scream, she said. <laughs> that, that would rule. That actually would be awesome. <laughs> That's Friday. I'm in love. <laughs> wow. Oh, B-52s announcing their retirement or no longer touring. It's amazing they were still touring though making money yeah in what casinos and corporate events yeah <laughs> we actually have a friend who uh went to a furniture convention and the b-52s performed it and he's like they played love shack like five times <laughs> yeah because it's one of those things where they just played a long time and people would just come in and out of where they were playing so it's just like all right this batch of people hasn't heard it yet <laughs> Every hour on the hour. That would be so... B- How long did they play to be playing it that many times? <laughs> we just picked the, the five biggest songs and run through them. 2006 is a year that I do remember very well. Big, big year for um, Skinny Jeans music, <laughs> for sure. Uh, we got we got some Taken Back Sundays. We've got some Under Oath. We've got... Oh, AFI, December Underground. Mm-hmm. That was a big one. A big one for me personally was No Heroes by Converge. That was the first Converge record I bought at the Best Buy. Like the, <laughs> probably like the week it came out. I couldn't get the... It was one of those CDs. Remember when the CDs would come with the... A slip case? The slip case cardboard sleeve thing. The, the factory had glued them on too tight. So I was just like trying to like jam the cd out of it and it would not budge and i finally just had to like peel the seam off (laughs) to get the cd out of the case to listen to it on the way home i had a cd that was um it was the christian rap metal band pillar and their fireproof album they had instead of a cardboard sleeve they had like a plastic one oh yeah and it was the same deal like it was too tight you couldn't get the cd out of it so i wound up having to like separate it because it was perforated on top i guess the where the sheet the sheets were perforated yeah so i wound up having like basically just tear the perforation so i get the stupid cd out and then they reissued it a year later yeah and i bought it you bought it again i think there was some new tracks or there was like a dvd with it or something that had fucking a game god damn it yep yep the deluxe edition a year later we're gonna throw one extra song on there and you get a dvd yep uh yeah, I got the Norma Jean Oh God the Aftermath Deluxe Addiction Edition. Yeah. Watched that DVD so many times. <laughs> I have so many there are so many quotes from that that are just like references that I make. Mo Hulk. Yep. Hey, is this, this you is guys', guys Seagams? Seagams. <laughs> you know, just like that is such a weird thing too with like I guess that happens when you're like a teenager early twenties where you just like obsessively watch something over and over again and it's like it's pretty obscure in the grand scheme of things, but you watched it at such an age and you quoted it so much at an age that like, it's just burned into your brain forever. Yeah. It's baked in. It's the, it's the SNL thing too, where it's like obscure SNL skits, usually like that came on at like 1230, the, the 10 to midnight, 10 to one type skits, skits yeah. that would, you see them at like just the right, point in your life and you reference them to someone else who saw it and then it just like yeah it just like gets baked in and i don't know i don't know why 
why it's like that. Does everyone have that? Is it just us? Do kids do that anymore? Well, no, we know it as other people do it because like it's like 19 year olds and 20 year olds are like always quoting things at each other. Yeah, yeah. So do you think, I guess that still happens too. I mean, yeah, definitely like people reference TikToks. Yeah. I don't think that those have the longevity though of like, like you, I feel like you don't have the, this is my one thing that I go back to yeah. anymore because you just kind of always have something new to reference. But I'm yeah. sure there's, I'm sure there's an, an equivalent. Uh, 2006 is, so I was trying to figure this out earlier and it kind of relates to our record we're talking about today, but is 2006 peak org core? Like it didn't get any higher than this? Or are we already on the downward? Well, because uh, hmm. Orgcore also has its relationship to Fest Punk, which is also like a different, also kind of Orgcore, but not. It's like, it's slightly different. This is probably the time period that is the high has the highest concentration of like pure Orgcore, like punk news bands. But I mean, yeah, that definitely you get that overlap of like side one dummy and like other fest punk and even like proto emo revival stuff starts to crop up pretty soon after Mm -hmm. this time period so but yeah if it was like if you were saying like lawrence arms hot water music style uh dude with beards dudes with beards with feelings (laughs) punk this is probably the this is probably the true peak of that so I say this to say these are the these are the ones that I I noticed I noticed these on Spotify I didn't dig much further, the Falcon released Unicornography, and the Lawrence Arms released O Calcutta. There's no Hot Water Music record, but there is a Draft record in a million pieces. Yeah, Dead to Me's Cuban Ballerina, Banner Pilots Past the Poison, which that's starting to verge onto Fest Punk. Yeah, uh, Latterman's We Are Still Alive, The Loved Ones Keep Your Heart. Rise Against the Sufferer and the Witness. That's probably the biggest, biggest one. I was wondering what else was... Those are the ones that I just found on Spotify, but I was kind of curious what popped up here on Rate Your Music. It's not going to be popular on Rate Your Music. It's definitely going to be pretty buried. Yeah. I guess that is the thing, too. Like, it wasn't ever that super popular, was it? Because the weird the weird thing is, like, this is the same year No FX puts out wolves and wolves clothing Mm -hmm. so there's even like rock against bush era kind of stuff that's still pretty big yeah because we're still in the bush administration (laughs) yeah yeah you're post-american idiot and definitely like where your rise against gets huge how they kind of like made that switch to being a rock band (laughs) (laughs) a radio rock band yeah anti-flag put out for blood and empire i want to say there's some pretty big folk punk stuff Maybe going on too. There's a Defiance of Higher record. Yeah. I don't know if AJJ had blown up yet by 06. I think 07 is where they get big. Like the very first Tiger's Jaw belongs to the dead came out in 06, but nobody listened to that. It is a funny time period because it's a little bit. Yeah, it's the, the Epifat sound has merged into the Rock Against Bush sound for that type of band. The emo third wave is pretty strong. With your Taking Back Sundays and your My Chemical Romances. Yeah. There's Hawthorne Heights record. There's a From yeah. First to Last record. There's lots of that stuff going on. Um, you've got the you've got the weird stuff. Um, you're like noise rock, sludge, post-hardcore kind of stuff. I'm looking at a page here that has Made Out of Babies <laughs> yeah. and Albatross and These Arms Are Snakes. That's that's all pretty big stuff. For us, Zayo released The Fears What Keeps Us Here, and he has legend released Suck Out the Poison. Underrated record. It really is. He's legend got lumped in as being a scene band, and then they turned into one of the Southern Rock bands, and then that was another thing. <laughs> that Southern Rock hardcore. The Pantera metalcore kid. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah, a l- weird really a weird thing to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's also you know this is like the beginnings of that like death wish hardcore like it hadn't quite really popped off yet but with converge kind of leading the way with no heroes 
And um, there's a dangerous record. Yeah, anger. It's it's an interesting time period where that there was a lot going on, but also everything was a little bit more. There's still a lot going on now, but now it feels more niche. Where at the time, I don't know if we were just the right age, but like all of this stuff felt kind of big. Like it was bigger. The visibility was higher. You heard about all of it. Yeah, you heard about it all. That's what it is. Like we weren't into the big popular emo stuff that was... It was huge and it was everywhere. And I mean, I think that's probably where, I think that's the, the, the rising tide. That's the bringing attention to all of this alternative culture and all of this punk and hardcore stuff, because really in terms of mainstream popularity, 2006 was probably the absolute peak of emo punk popularity and culture. Yeah. Because it was, it was absolutely everywhere. Like, our little redneck town in North Carolina had like a local metalcore scene. Yeah. With like a lot ten, of bands, 10 or more bands. Yeah. Yeah. And then overlapping with like, you know, related, you know, adjacent counties uh, and area codes. Yeah. It's which, funny. if you look at the teen culture of a hickory now, it's n- normal people, it's normie. Yeah. Country music, pop, in kids. Yeah, like scene stuff was bigger in high schools and back then. And I don't know what the what replaced it. <laughs> Vaping and uh, <laughs> and gaming. Gaming. Gaming I think did get very normalized. Anime. Yeah, like, that's literally so- all Zoomers love anime. That's your that's your subculture, cause like the jocks and rednecks don't love anime stuff. Well, no, yeah. But the jocks and rednecks didn't love this stuff either. So <laughs> some of them did. Well, yeah, there were rednecks. There, it was they were close. They were closer. <laughs> yeah, but jocks and rednecks now play video games. Like everybody plays video games. Yeah, 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 yeah. The d- average dude, uh, superhero movies. Like that's superhero movies and video games. Like yeah. Ca- I go see the every single Marvel movie that comes out, and I play Call of Duty, <laughs> yeah. and I watch sports. Yeah. That's the mainstream dude. The mainstream dude, yeah, watches Marvel movies. So weird. How did that happen? I mean, well, I don't know. Personally, I blame the Pentagon. <laughs> yeah. Big digression there, I guess. Um, Yeah, sorry. (laughs) But yeah, but like going back to our earlier point of it being everywhere and you hearing about everything like that's and that's where it that's where for us personally, like it that intersection happens with punk as we would describe it as what we would be most interested in for the next decade plus of our lives, like being being these these metal well, being these Christian rock kids into getting into metal, getting into like brown pants, smart guy, extreme metal, and then also like simultaneously digging into classic punk and watching Fuse and making fun of emo <laughs> on the internet and reading magazines and going, oh, huh, that sounds interesting. And then just like hearing different, a lot of different things all the time just listening to comps so having this kind of like having all of this access and i mean i think a lot of it was like a lot of it was that we had people writing about music yeah everywhere all the time and all kinds of music and you weren't in a little bubble as much to where you only heard about your chosen scenes music well let's try and tie that into our record today so the album we are listening to today, selected by our patron, it is This Is Satire by None More Black.
do my little little stats. None more black were from New Jersey. I could not find a specific city, which usually means it's from a bunch of cities. It's just they all live, reside in the state, and they drive to practice. Formed in the year 2000, this is the band's second full-length album. It was released after File Under Black in 2003 and the Loud About Loathing EP in 2004. It was released on Fat Records on May 2nd, 2006, and then issued on vinyl by Sabo Records. Personnel on this album is Jason Shevchuk on vocals and guitar, Paul Delaney on bass, Jared Shavelson on drums, and Colin McGinnis on guitar. And the album was produced by Jay Robbins at the Magpie Cage, uh, who during this time period, he was working with bands like Clutch and Modern Life is War and Paint It Black, among others. Jason Shevchuk is formerly of the band Kid Dynamite, and he quit Kid Dynamite to go to film school and to, quote, sort some stuff out. And he came out of school, decided to start a new band. Sort some stuff out means a girl, right? Uh, I don't know. Don't know. Not sure how that, uh... I, I assume relationship stuff, but, yeah. I, I could see it. I mean, he did go to film school, so... Yeah. It, it could have just been him being like, I need to not be a punk <laughs> for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I meant to look up and see what Jason does now. I mean, he's done, he has projects, but music is not his career currently, obviously. So I, I, I'm i hoping he used that film school to uh, get some work, but uh, we can dig into that later. So, yeah, I'll talk about the other members and what they did and stuff later. But, uh, yeah, the band's name comes from, this is Spinal Tap, the old none, none more black joke. What's, bl- what's blacker than black? Yeah. <laughs> what is your... None more black. What was your none more black introduction? I don't know specifically what it was. I was trying to pinpoint it. First of all, I want to say thank you for assigning a none more black album. Like no one would pick this. Yeah. A, yeah. Guest wouldn't just pick this album. Unless I mean like the random person who has maybe some personal significant attachment to this record of this band. But it's not. No one's thinking like. Oh, none more black. That's essential. We got to talk about none more black. But yeah. it's it's surprisingly is essential to me. Like none more black is a band that was so instructional to me of what punk is. Like, I mean, it's of a piece with like Dillinger Four and a lot of the stuff that we've got got into around that time period. But I remember listening to none more black a ton, and I remember listening to Kid Dynamite a ton early on so it's it, none more black feels so much to me like a band that's been forgotten but they're really they were really good and they were really important more important than i think they get credit for and it's maybe a, maybe it's a legacy thing more than anything but because they were the band that like if you missed kid dynamite well you can get you can get none more block at least <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I th- oh, so my I think I know my introduction is is a little bit more clear. So uh, they're a band I got into thanks to our good friend Grant McCracken, who runs Bitter Melody Records. So he, when I was first getting into punk and hardcore, after my years of being a metalhead, so it was my like, I'm exiting metal. What else is there? And uh, punk was kind of the thing. I was like, oh, this kind of punk, the uh, Dillinger Fours. Um, Civil War probably being the like that's the, the turn yeah the turning point there for sure and so we would do this thing where like each of us would just pass each other mp3 cds where you'd like you throw like a bunch of you know albums on an mp3 cd and then you could just upload it to your computer and so he would have given me he probably gave me a couple I don't know if he gave me all of the No More Black Records but at least one or two um, he probably and so that's how I would have heard those for the first time, though, maybe, maybe not the first time. So, but yeah, it was kind of a fun way to trade albums at once. It was uh, not quite, uh, you could download music pretty easily, but I don't know. This seemed just like way, it was more like it was uh, curated this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and I would have heard them through you. So I'm yeah. sure it was just like, hey, you should listen to this. And and I did. So I like, I probably downloaded other stuff but so i was 
I was probably there's a good chance though that I was familiar with them prior because I did know Kid Dynamite because I got into Paint It Black in college, downloading through blogs, and then I learned about the whole Lifetime family tree. Though weirdly, it would take me longer to get into Lifetime than any of them. So I was like, "Cool, Paint It Black. Oh, there's this other band. All right, Kid Dynamite. Cool, they're good too." And then I probably you know I was very I was V online, very online. And uh, so I definitely would have like seen Kid Dynamite and None More Black being like referenced in blog posts or the message boards or anything along those lines. So like I was probably aware of the name and I do think there was a None More Black song on a Warp Tour compilation. It might be Dinners for Suckers. I wanted to pull up and see if I could find which one it was specifically and it would yeah 2003 yep dinner for snucker snuckers suckers yeah the, the 2003 warp tour comp between me first and the gimme gimme's cover of harder they come and maxine oh wow <laughs> i love the 2003 warp tour comp 2002 and 2003 i think were the best ones they put together um because they were still very epifat and they hadn't quite shifted to the to the emo stuff that would do a little bit later but yeah so that song was on there that's probably the first i heard that before i really knew anything about the band so uh yeah i was familiar with this record um did you how familiar with this one specifically were you i've heard it i wasn't super familiar with this one specifically i i think that i had like a pretty small selection of their stuff so this one I don't know like I don't know it as well as File Under Black and the EP Loud About Loathing I definitely was pretty familiar familiar with that one. Yeah. So they're they're earlier stuff more than than this one. Yeah, I think so too. I think yeah, as far as the LPs goes, um I was probably most familiar with File Under Black. I would but I distinctly kind of remember liking Loud About Loathing the most out of everything they put out. Like, if if you would have asked me, like, what's your favorite? That's probably what I would have picked prior to revisiting. I would like to revisit all of it now, though, just to kind of get an idea on all of, you know, each record. But No More Black were definitely one of those bands where it was just like, they're good. They're really good. It's, a, it's the next thing after Kid Dynamite. So if you're crying about No More Kid Dynamite records... At least you got none more black though they are very different yeah they're pretty different i mean his voice though yeah that's the thing like he has his voice that's it and then there's nobody else who really sounds like him the closest you get is like what shook ones that guy sounds a lot like him yeah and then there's like a new band called duchamp who got jason to sing on the record and that singer also kind of sounds like <laughs> jason so, the, but they're a newer band. I think they even got Brendan Kelly on that record too. I think they're French. I think they're just like obsessed with <laughs> orgcore. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, that's a bad French accent, but <laughs> yeah, we need um, we need our friend from Dokcho Ost. <laughs> <laughs> well, revisiting it, how how did it anything? Well, let's see. How did it hold up? Anything illuminating? What did you th- what did you think of it upon revisit? I loved it. Yeah, Love. yeah, strong. Loved Love. it. It was, it's good. It's so good. Beginning to end. And it's, it's that perfect, I don't know. It's that perfect package of, of that, like your standard issue punk guitar tone. Yeah. Uh, humbuckers through a Marshall JCM 800. <laughs> it's like, it's 100% hot water music guitar tone. It's just like muddy and crunchy and a terrible singer. Who's just like screaming the whole time but it's like really <laughs> catchy and melodic and the they have funny phrases song titles but then they also have like really meaningful lyrics that really that cut through and hit you yeah it's 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 perfect it's a it's a time capsule but i think it's pretty timeless too because there's a million bands that sound like this from the time but you and maybe it's just personal like it was so formative to me that it's just always going to appeal to me. But I, I feel like you can pull it from, I think you can pull a record like this from this time period, completely present it with no context and people will connect to it. 
I think there's something about it that is just urgent and passionate that really shows and really makes it worth revisiting, easy to revisit. I think it holds up really well. was like whoop i haven't listened to this in a long time number black was a band that kind of fell out of my rotation i don't really know what it is because i always liked them they were never i guess they were never like my favorite band and uh, i just yeah the rotation they fell out of the rotation and then anytime i was in the mood for him for his voice i tended to go to kid dynamite yeah because it's you know shorter faster and it has that kid dynamite thing that you yeah. that is you it's the lifetime painted black side of it yeah which is funny because you think that this record would have that too because uh, i mentioned this earlier members of this band were also in painted black so colin the guitar player he was playing in painted black around this time he's on the record paradise which is the j church uh, j robbins record and then jared the drummer would play and paint it black on New Lexicon and the three seven inches. So it's like Jason leaves Kid Dynamite. They start painting it black. They get Colin on the second record. Colin leaves after the second record. Jared joins after the, <laughs> on the third record and does the seven inches. So it's very tied together in the family tree. Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking about that family tree and the the back and forth. And I was also thinking about the geographical thing too because. You were talking about None More Black is from New Jersey. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's funny because Kid Dynamite was from Philly. Yeah. But Lifetime was from New Jersey. <laughs> so it's like Lifetime members leave Asbury Park, move to Philly, play in Kid Dynamite. Kid Dynamite members leave Philly, move to New Jersey, play None More Black. <laughs> It is I mean, fun- it's it's Philly and New Jersey are they're like across the river from each other. It's not it's not yeah. impossible to to yeah to swap. make that move back and forth. <laughs> uh, Jared also plays in Boy Sets Fire currently. He started with that the very last Boy Sets Fire full length, I think. That's the, that's his first record he's on, and he's also in the Hope Conspiracy. So he's a little busy guy there. Uh, Paul came from the band Kill Your Idols. That's mm. where he joins the band it's just not all these hardcore guys and then they like start a band that's not hardcore yeah it's pop punk it's they're definitely yeah. trying to write pop punk it's very hook based it's mm-hmm. very there's no breakdowns i mean not like hardcore breakdowns there are moments that you could probably def- define as a breakdown musically but so you want you were talking about them being important earlier are you just saying that because they're important to you or do you think they were like genuinely important and big for at the time? I mean, they definitely weren't top tier at the time and not even personally either, but and I think it I think the legacy uh, aspect of it has a lot to do with it that they come from a prominent band that a lot of people missed. So people talked about them and referenced them a lot. Like I I just I remember seeing their name referenced a lot i almost want to say well yeah they just they they came up a lot i I think that's the that's the main thing and they don't anymore like they did at the the time and they don't anymore so that's what i was gonna say is like what is it about them that they just 
don't get referenced. Like, you don't really hear people talk about them anymore. They didn't last long enough, and they didn't have those records. Is that is that what it is? They just weren't they weren't iconic enough. Yeah, they didn't have that one record that everyone heard. Yeah, and yeah, they didn't keep going. Yeah, they were kind of inconsistent. So, like, uh, I was looking up their like lineup, like their band history type stuff, and so like the band would go on hiatus after this record. They went on hiatus in two thousand and seven. But then it was only like a year off because they came back in 2008. But then they also took a while. They didn't release their third LP until 2010. And then it says they've been inactive since 2016. But I wouldn't be surprised if they were even like not that very active before. There is a, I guess there's the uh, not a full-time band aspect of it. I don't get the impression they were a full-time band. I don't know what their touring was like. Yeah, probably not as active. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't, and I don't know what it. I don't know why it was a, that they were a band that I felt like they came up all the time. That people referenced them all the time. It's not that we were referencing them all the time because I mean, like we've said, like we listened to them, but they weren't like the top tier of like our favorite bands from this time period that we were listening to. Yeah, it's really it's funny. I'm I remember a few years ago, like some Spotify generated playlist. But, oh, there's legwork on just like a playlist for me. And I'm like, that I was just like, I need I have like five, my record ended. I have like five minutes left of this drive. Let me just throw on one of these playlists. And that song co- comes on and I'm like, damn, that's so good. I love that riff. I love that sound. And then I was playing that riff at practice with my drummer who was into like Hot Water Music, Nothing Tin, Propagandi. I'm trying to think of the bands that he referenced a lot. He was a big fan of the Bronx. And like, I was playing that riff and I'm like, I love that none more black song. And it was like, he was like, I don't remember that band. <laughs> I was like, huh? I feel like they were, I feel like that would be a band you would, <laughs> you would know. That's funny that that's one that you missed. So I don't know. Maybe it was just whatever circle that we were in. They came up a lot, but well, okay. And I also just made this connection too. Do you have a specific person in mind when you think of No More Black? What do you someone, mean? Pers- someone online. Uh, someone online, a personality that you would have been following or or through the internet years. Um, uh, no, not really. Not any, anyone specific. Okay. Well, I do. So when I think of No More Black, I think of Brittany Strummer, who... Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. She was like the none more black mega fan and the jason shevchuk me- mega fan she always called him her husband or something online like she had this her tumblr was great for constantly you know talking about jason who unfortunately you know we lost her a few years ago i was i was but she was 2019 yeah she was uh she was friends with everyone brenda kelly mike park uh Laura Jane grace Laura like Jane, yeah she was massively involved in punk music. She was a writer for punk news, maybe an editor as well. So she, being an editor, probably like had a little bit of like, let's just keep them in, in everybody's mind just a little bit longer than maybe would have. But yeah, I, I she whenever I think of None More Black, I think of Britney. So that's probably who kept the flame going post breakup, you know? kept them in the in the consciousness maybe so me revisiting it i definitely was like ah oh, this record's just good it's just fun enjoyable feels like it's from a time period like it's definitely like of its day but it's also like probably my favorite era of music it's the era where i'm like i want more bands like this again like cuz we don't really have them like this anymore I mean, we yeah. do, we do because some of them are still around, but you know, new ones, new ones, new ones. Yeah, <laughs> we want, we want fresh meat. <laughs> I think something that I was just thinking about this just a second ago, maybe something that lended itself to what, why I enjoyed listening to this record as much as I did when I did this week. I listened to the new Dan Andriano that morning on my way to work. So that was kind of like a bookend, like I had in which the the new Dan Andriano record 
didn't click with me the first time I listened to it, but it did that time. So there's like this familiar progression from that era. And then I'm going and listening to something at the end of my day that's like from that time period and being like, ah, connecting the dots. Yeah. Giants, any big standout moments for you or elements to the album? Not re I mean, it's really consistent throughout. Um, if I had paid more attention to the track listing while I was listening to the record, I could probably point out specific songs. Um, Opinions and Assholes, We Dance on the Ruins of the uh, of the Stupid Stage, um, My Wallpaper Look Like Paint, those kind of stand out while I'm looking at these tracks. Icy London underrated lyricist if you read them yeah i'm i'm looking at the lyrics for icy london and i'm the humid night just sticks to my skin is that's a fucking good line (laughs) yeah i was looking at the lyrics too while we were sitting here i meant to like actually like go through and read them before but it's like i don't know hey mr postman quit bringing me lemons there's far more than i can use the tumbling on my closet rolling on from under my bed he had he actually sings kind of the way he uh, writes, or he writes the way he sings. He's got that, you know, like, very, I don't know what you call that. It's a, it's a patter. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, it's, maybe it's kind of a Bob dylan a little bit of an Elvis Costello, kind of like, not alliteration, but like, almost alliteration. Yeah. It's not, it's not illiterate, yeah, but it's like... Very punctuated. It's, like he can, he can break down his, the words into perfect syllables, like he, he can make them fit to whatever rhythm he's doing. It's an interesting writing style, because they're actually very wordy songs. Yeah. Which is probably why it's kind of hard to sing along with them, or Black, that and his voice is so hard to match that you're just like, I can't sing along with this. Yeah, some standouts to me on the record are under my feet the second track lots of haze and woes any song with like a lot of haze and woes i was reading though that the song under my feet was originally called slytherin my ass <laughs> because he did he went on the was harry potter website and got sorted into the slytherin house <laughs> slytherin my ass <laughs> and uh fat rex said that they were like uh, J.K. Rowling might actually sue us, so let's let's change the name of the song. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a standout. Zing Pong really stood out for me. It's a it's a more minor. It starts kind of minor key. It's very it's darker sounding, but it has like a really strong power pop chorus to it, and it's also the one that has the Ducktales bass line. Do 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 do. The Circuit City bass line. <laughs> yeah, where services stay to the yard. Uh, loved with the transit coat on. The guitar work kind of reminded me of some alkaline trio. Who crosses state lines without a shirt is fun. It's got like a Heartland rock sort of sound to it. A lot of gang vocals and church bells in the background, which is yeah. kind of funny. D is for Doorman. Come on in. Has some really good guitar work. Ten Ton Gigawatts has has like a country boogie to it. It's kind of twangy. Yeah, this just like this whole thing. It's a lot of different sounding 
that's part of it though so like it's a punk record but it doesn't sound like every single punk record it's not your typical three chord punk it's not even like your typical like sk- it's not skate punk it's not just like the basic same thing over and over again like they do a lot of different types of guitar parts on this record the song structure isn't like verse chorus either like it's very just very different um but then you'll, you'll do a song that has like a country vibe to it next to a song that's got like the boxcar rhythm the jawbreakers boxcar rhythm mm-hmm. and then the but then ends with some uk oi and then the next one has some celtic sounding riffs like it's i'm describing it in a way that makes you go this is what they don't sound like all those things they don't really but it's just these little it's a little it's a it's a lean yeah it's the implication it sounds like i'm I'm describing an un i don't know just like is this record chaotic sounding like is it all over the place does it not know what it wants to be and no it just borrows from everything which that's kind of what that's kind of what i would say is org core yeah it's true and, and i think maybe org core as it past this point it leaned more into the heartland rock yeah thing spe- more specifically but but yeah i think it's just i think for the most part it's hardcore guys trying out everything that they want to do that's not hardcore yeah which i think shows like in the other stuff too like you're listening to lagricia which is the mm-hmm. band he did it wasn't after it was like but it was like around it was 2008 i think is when that record came out so it was like after they reunited but it's a different sounding album too like it's almost like a post hardcore record the way it's written and played very casket lottery yeah maybe that's influence. what it is but it's, yeah. it's definitely jason's voice and then like icons comes up later it's a little different um and then when the band is over jason starts former member which is his current project he's working on which is such a good name because jason shevchuk is the epitome of former member guy because <laughs> You read an un- an article about none more black from around this time. Every single one will mention Kid Dynamite. We've mentioned it on this podcast. It's literally impossible to talk about none more black without bringing up Kid Dynamite. And I think back then it was probably worse as far as because they're like we're just trying to do something different. But also Jason's voice does not sound different. <laughs> he sings more, but yeah, it he's he suffers from that that can that former member condition so it's kind of it's perfect for him so it, they basically are haven't been active since 2016 but they also strike me as one of those bands that could very easily be like hey yeah we uh came back and did a record or hey yeah, we're doing a tour or we're playing a festival like they or, just yeah, seem like playing fest yeah like they could just do it i think i saw i saw kid dynamite no more black may have played two at fest and i might have been there but i also don't really remember if i was or not but yeah, they just seem like one that could just come right back. No problem. Even though they have had a lot of different members, surprisingly. Yeah. The last thing I have really in my notes is uh, the album art is, um, what would you describe that? It's a demented clown with snake arms and dragons on in the artwork? <laughs> it's pretty ugly. So what's weird is the art is by Paul Romero, who has done the art for pretty much every single Mastodon record. Mm. He, he did mm-hmm. the Remission and Leviathan artwork. He did the Villainy and Virtue artwork for Dead to Fall. He did that Trivium record, like that one Trivium record that's that painted looking thing. Yeah. And really it's like, oh yeah, he has a very distinct style of art that works very well for metal covers. And then you look at this and you're like, how's it? What? How's this the same guy? I mean, it's a completely different style from literally anything else he's done. It's just funny. It's like, oh, it's just line. I bet he just did line work on this instead of whatever, you know, instead of painting it like maybe those other ones are or digital is maybe some of the later stuff's probably digital. Yeah. I don't know what the, if his process would be different, but yeah, it's just funny to be like, huh? This, that guy did this record. <laughs> and then lastly, in 2006, Fat Wreck, we've mentioned a lot of these albums, but the same year released that they released this, they also released O Calcutta. They released that loved ones record they released strike anywhere's dead fm they released wolves and wolves clothing they released that live against me record americans abroad they released cuban ballerina 
I mean, first of the Gimme Gimme's record, Good Riddance, The St. Catharines. It's just like, they were cranking out albums during this time period. And while they're probably not all like classic records, they're notable, you know? Yeah, everything everything's tied together in your mind because you saw all of those album covers on the same <laughs> advertisement page in whatever <laughs> magazine that you saw them in. <laughs> yeah. Or on the sidebar of recently reviewed records on punk news. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I th- this was a fun one to revisit. I, uh, Timothy, thank you so much for picking this album for us to talk about. It's a fun dive onto a record that not everyone's going to pick. But I guarantee you, though, it's the type of record that people who follow our show and when they see it in their like podcast feed or like on Instagram, they're going to be like, oh, awesome. Like, I think... People are going to get excited. The people who know the record are going to be very excited to see that this is this is the episode we talked about. So, because I was excited when he when he picked it and messaged, he told me what he was choosing, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that'd be a good one." <laughs> yeah, it's a good it's a good one. Yeah, yeah, a good record. It's, there's a lot to talk about personal significance, but not many people would pick it. Mm-hmm. It's good. That's kind of what I think of when I think of the ten dollar tier. Like that's what I think it should be used for. That's what I would pick. If yeah. I was a guest on the show, I would look for those records. Yeah. And I think that happens. I think that happens frequently, actually. That's probably why we've missed so many big records. Yeah. <laughs> why it took us 180 episodes to get to Fugazi. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, there's this little band. Yeah. Uh, with Minor Threat and Rights of Spring members. <laughs> but yeah. So if you want to make your pick for uh, a future episode, join the Patreon. Because I think I think it, I don't know. You want to make the if you want to make the choice for a new generation. Because <laughs> I genuinely have listened to a record and then been like, "Are there any podcasts about this?" And most of the time, there aren't. That's the part yeah. that drives me crazy. I'm like, "What? How has no one done this?" Uh, whatever. So yeah, if you ever feel that way, shoot us a message and let us know what you want to talk about. But yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This was a fun episode. I enjoyed it. A uh, little technical glitches that I'm going to have to play with at the end, but whatever. Shouldn't be too hard to fix. No. But yes, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. A little fun. Is this, what do you think? Is this the test pressing? No, this is it. Yes, this that's is right. Smell the glove by that's, Spinal Tap. When you that's go to the smell school, the glove. That's the, that's the jacket cover that's going out across the country so the in every store. Yes. Is it going to say anything here? It doesn't even say nope, anything. No, it's not going to say anything. So it's just going to be like this, all It's going to be that simple, beautiful, classic. It does look like, you know, black leather. You can yeah. see yourself I in both Shiny sides. I wouldn't yeah. feel so bad. It's like it's a black mirror. So bad. Yeah, it, it is. Like well, I think it looks like death. David, it looks death. like morning. Every, I mean, looks... every, every, every movie in every cinema is about death. Death sells. I but think he's right. There's something about it? this that, that, that's so black. It's like, how much more black could this be? And the answer is none. None is that good? more black. Mm-hmm. Is that I, 